Well, good morning and uh, welcome to another edition of Elevenses with Kevin Williams here of Survival Skills Rider Training. Um, we've uh, put a show together for you today, which I hope you'll enjoy. Um, there's been a bit of a dearth of biking news today. There's not a lot to actually tell you about uh, newsworthy. Um, uh, the Unfortunately, the feed is still full of bike crashes, um, fatal accidents, um, serious accidents, um, one involving a motorcycle and a, a, apparently a bus which uh, burst into flames after the bike collided with it. But uh, I don't want to keep boring you with stories about bike crashes. So what we do have in the show is uh, it's not a, well, a crash actually that involved a motorcycle outrider on a cycle race, something I've done myself is a bit of motorcycle outriding. Um, some collector's bikes are going under the hammer in Belfast, including a Jerry Dunlop special. Um, some news about my own training. I'm opening up a new area in Hertfordshire and Bedfordshire. Um, uh how much would you pay for a cx 500 with a thousand kilometers on the clock um good question we'll have a look at cx 500s and finally we'll ask about whether or not the right answer to bike crashes is more training it was an article that bmf uh, wrote some years ago and it's a position they've been promoting so if you've got a question uh, a comment uh, any suggestions for a future show um, do drop me a line. I will get back to you during the um, once I've finished live on air. All right. Okay. So um, on with the first piece of news. Then um, there was a serious accident involving a motorcycle outrider on a Polish cycle race this week. Um, the opening stage of it's the first po uh, post-COVID UCI stage race, and the opening stage was actually cancelled after a serious bike crash. Now, exactly what happened is unclear. Um, some reports say that the rider was seriously injured and taken to hospital. Other eyewitness reports say that he was actually killed in the collision. But whatever the case, the race was abandoned. Um, motorcycle outriders are a familiar sight when escorting the riders of races. Now, you probably noticed that with the sort of big stage races like the Tour de France, the Giro d'Italia, the Vuelta, the Spania, they take place on totally closed roads. What happens is that the, uh, there is a notice put in place weeks in advance to say that particular roads will be closed from one end to the other. And uh, if you are still on the road, when the police go along and check, uh, vehicles will be uh, there to remove your vehicle. You will be towed away. So the, the, the race environment is as safe as the uh, it can be made. Every vehicle is removed from those roads and all the access roads are blocked off. Everybody knows about it and nobody uh, circumvents those regulations. But many of the lesser uh stage races but still important races are organized with what's called a rolling road closure now what happens there is rather than close the road uh, sort of like the, literally the beginning of the day um you can still use the road and park on it um until almost before the race arrives and, uh, and then basically what happens is you'll get outriders and uh, the police usually will ride along they will stop traffic they'll direct everybody to come to a halt um traveling marshals will then block junctions to stop traffic egressing onto the road as the race goes past the race clears through and then the road is opened up behind it so that's a rolling road closure um so basically that puts the uh, people using those roads to minimum inconvenience. Um, but it does come with a risk. If drivers don't realise that the road is closed, maybe they have turned out of a driveway between the time that the police riders go past and the race itself arrives, then the race itself can encounter unexpected problems. Um, you know, this, this has happened on races in the UK, which operate this rolling road closure system. There have been some quite nasty crashes. But this happened on in Poland, as I say, and it was the first day of the 68th running of the Dukula Matsowaza stage race, excuse my Polish. Um, and it happened with 30 kilometres of the 160 eight kilometre stage remaining. Um, so it was just outside Warsaw. 
Apparently, the motorcyclist hit a minibus. Um, according to Eurosport Poland, the motorcyclist was trying to overtake a vehicle at the head of the convoy, that is, so that they can get back to the beginning of the race and again block junctions either side and stop traffic coming the other way when the collision actually happened. So that vehicle almost certainly should not have been on the road at that point. Uh, the broadcaster said that the rider was taken to hospital with serious injuries. Um, removed by helicopter but the uh, Gazzetta dello Sport from Italy who are obviously very big on covering cycling um, their conflicting account was given by Dan Daniel Colosso who's the sports director of one of the UCI uh, teams and he said that the rider was actually killed in the crash so that first stage was abandoned completely the second stage which is a 2.7 kilometer time trial which is going to be held as a, a racehorse track uh, so a closed course that's going ahead but uh, whether or not the two following stages out on the roads will carry on is currently in the hands of the polish prosecutor okay so it's still to come um some information about my new training area in hertfordshire and bedfordshire how much would you pay for a hundred thousand pound kilometer uh, 100,000 kilometer CX500 and more training. Are the BMF right? Um, collector's bikes up for sale, first of all. Uh, let's just get the relevant um, item up on the screen. I forgot to do this again. One day I will remember. Um, share screen, uh, window. The, basically, the bike is this one here. Um, you probably recognize it as a VTR 1000. Now, it's a bit hard to believe, but uh, my biggest bike racing hero, Jay Dunlop, he was killed in a crash 20 years ago, earlier this month. Um, he had just completed the third hat trick at the TT, uh, three wins at the 20, 2000, 2000 TT. And uh, sadly, he was killed just uh, a month later at an almost unknown race at Tallinn in Estonia on the 2nd of July. At the TT event in 2000, Dunlop won the F1 TT uh, on a VTR 1000, very much like the one you see in front of you. The ultra lightweight, which was is on 125s at that time, and the lightweight TT, which was raced on 250s. Um, so that lifted his own personal total of wins to 26, which uh, was then and remains today, two decades later, a record. The bike itself was commissioned to commemorate uh, Dunlop's victories, and this particular model comes from the collection of a chap called George Miller, who was uh, not only a bike dealer, but a renowned expert and enthusiast. And he collected this motorcycle along with many others. So his, his collection uh, comes with uh, 40 years worth of motorcycles, and uh, they're going under the hammer, uh, on Monday, 27th of July, uh, to through till Friday, the 31st. Uh, so this SP1 is probably the most important bike in the collection. Uh, it was commissioned by Surrey dealer Tippett's Motors, uh, who were based in Surbiton, and um, there were only 26 of these models produced, one for every win in Dunlop's career. The bike's only got three miles on the clock, so clearly it's never been ridden on the road. Um, what else could you find in the sale? Well, uh, there will be a uh, limited edition 1981 Triumph Bonneville, one of 125 models produced. This was the Royal Wedding Edition, uh, commemorating the wedding of Diana and Charles. That one might not be quite so popular, I guess. Um, you'll find uh, some Daytona 500, a Speed Twin, um, there'll be a CBF, uh, sorry, a CB750F, the original superbike. Um, Aerial 350 Red Hunter, um, a G80 uh, matchless. A Hercules W2000, if I remember correctly, that's a radial engine, um, which would make it a fairly unique motorcycle. And uh, something else, a very, very, very unique motorcycle, an Ehrlich 250 GP. If you've never heard of, uh, I think he was a doctor, Ehrlich, um, worth looking up. It's a long time since I've heard his name, and I would need to refresh my mind. But uh, he was an expert, I seem to recall, on uh, two-stroke engines and 
gas flow and all sorts of things like that and um, turned his attention to improving motorcycles so um, it's likely to be a lot of interest in the sale um, the bikes as I say will be going up for auction at the end of the month so okay um, next item we've got is uh, about CX500s and uh, we'll finish off with that uh, question about whether training is the right answer to bike crashes um, but just before I go on with that I'm just going to tell you a little bit more about my new training area um, I've been changing my courses up as you probably guessed to deal with the COVID-19 crisis and uh, one of the things I'm doing is trying to make the courses out on the road uh, short and snappy so that we don't actually need to stop for breaks in cafes and that kind of thing. Um, if we can avoid that, I think we're all a bit safer and I think that's probably a good idea for the foreseeable future. So to, to, to that end, one of the things I've, uh, I've, I've looked for is a, a, a site somewhere where I can meet and then go out onto the roads and get a good couple of hours riding in somewhere uh, around the Watford area. So I've found a, a little petrol station we can meet in near St Albans, and that gets us pretty much straight out onto some lovely roads around the back of the Chilterns. And I was out there yesterday putting the route together. Um, it, go, it runs out towards Whipsnade. There are some testing roads out there, some uh, excellent fast stretches. There are some um, pretty surprisingly awkward corners. Um, you've got everything that basically you need for a good cornering course. And if we need to do work in town, if somebody's booked one of my uh, ride to work courses, there is certainly plenty of town to see in the Watford and Rickmansworth area. Uh, St Albans itself is uh, fairly busy, but Watford and Rickmansworth are certainly a challenge. And we've got the motorway as well, of course. So if anybody wants motorway training, then there's plenty to do in that area. Um, so have a look at the uh, ride to work and uh, ride for fun courses. If you're interested in some training, drop me a line. Right, okay, so um, how much for a CX500? Uh, well, let's just have a look at the uh, bike in question. Um, I'm just gonna find the picture again. Here it is. Let me get that up on screen. Okay, so 1978 S-Reg CX500, and how much does the owner want for it? Uh, well, a fairly astonishing £1,600. Now, um, the plastic maggot, as it was affectionately or perhaps not so affectionately known, um, was introduced in the late 1970s. The S-plate there gives it away. I think that was the first year they came out. Um, and let's put that in perspective. Punk was still going strong. Clubs were full of drainpipe jeans. I was still buying vinyl albums at the brand new Virgin Megastore in Oxford Street. Um, by the early 80s, the kind of heyday of that bike, London was knee deep in them. Uh, thousands of couriers bought them um, and they rode them every single day. And uh, not unusually, we would all load them up with some uh, camping kit uh, once a year in September. And quite a few of us would head off to the Ball d'Or in the south of France for a few days of sun, booze and 24-hour racing. Um, I wrote some years ago an article called, uh, which I, where, where I asked, is it the best bike that was ever built? Now, it's still actually a decent question to ask. Now, as I said, you, the... There was a pick of couriers. Now, one of the things that I've always said to people is that what couriers ride is a really good indication of what's cheap and efficient to run. Um, it doesn't break down. Um, the one thing that kills your earnings if you're a courier is a bike that's off the road. So, you know, people did do oddball things. You would every now and again see somebody doing some dispatching on something like a, um, a Ducati. But the vast majority of us to pick something uh, reliable to do the job. Um, other bikes came and went in the courier market, notably Kawasaki's GT550. But you know, realistically, none of them survived as long as a practical workhorse as the CX500. Even now, 40 years on, while they've just about vanished, you do see one or two a bike. And you know, bizarrely, in some ways, uh, given its background, they're becoming collectible. Now, that 
the bike was actually very competitively priced when it first came out. It was under a £1,000. Um, it was cheaper than the outwardly similar Moto Guzzi V50, um, but it didn't get an easy ride. Uh, the press in particular were pretty harsh on the bike. I remember one magazine review ridiculing the CX500 as being a cut price at Moto Guzzi. But in fact, it was anything but because the CX was absolutely designed from the ground up. It broke so many of the design rules, um, which I'm about to go through. Um, whilst it looked like a simple V-twin, um, Honda really did do it the hard way absolutely abounded in innovations um the first thing to say is that you know that engine there stuck out in the air um a, a transverse v twin is easy to air cool but honda decided to use water cooling now water cooling wasn't absolute wasn't new there were a few bikes around with water cooling but this was really probably the first genuine mass market machine that was accepted as an air, as a water-cooled motorcycle. Um, and the reason they decided it needed water cooling was because that it was a high-compression four-valve head uh, stuck on top of it. Um, you know, again, most motorcycles to that point hadn't gone as far as four valves per cylinder. Now we accept it as everyday technology. But at that point, it was uh, seen as a bit of a break. So it needed water cooling. And they stuck the radiator away behind the front wheel. Um, and that was a really real novelty at the time. Another novelty was an easy access car type spin off oil filter. Now, you take that for granted these days. Um, just probably just put a wrench on it and just undo it and uh, off it comes. But up to that point, many bikes had had um, the oil filter sort of buried somewhere in the engine, even if they were behind an easy to remove cover. Um, they still had to have something unbolted and bolted back on, you know, my, um, but the, the, the CX had the oil filter exposed. It was a bit of a weakness in some ways because they rusted as well um, on some of the older models that were used on salty roads. But it, for, at the time, it was a real innovation. Something else that um, the designers wanted to do was they wanted to keep the carburetors away from banging on the rider's knees now if you think about the conventional v-twin the carbs come straight back out of the head and that's where your knees sit so what most designers of v-twins do moto guzzi for example was they put a kink in the inlet track so the v sat out like that and then the carburetors rather than coming straight back towards you they were twisted in at an angle so um, but that didn't give a straight shot for the inlet gases to go into the cylinder, and that slows down the inlet gases, and that reduces power consumption. So what Honda did was they put a twist in the head. Instead of the head sitting at nice and straight, they turned them actually inwards. You can see it quite clearly, actually, in that picture there. They also brought the 90-degree V, which is a perfectly balanced engine, into 80 to make it a little bit narrower and to get those carbs even better tucked out of the way. So the exhaust had to be angled at the same amount outward. So that created some other problems. Um, the angled heads meant that you couldn't use chain drive to the overhead cam. Um, so that meant push rods. Now push rods are bits of metal that go up and down from a cam to push literally on the valve. Um, the problem with push rods is that they don't allow engines to rev very high. Now Honda wanted a high revving engine. The bike was designed to reach 10,000 rpm so it was a very short stroke um, to get the power but the angled heads meant push rods so what did they do? they mixed and matched they put a cam shaft in the middle of the v down at the bottom and then they powered it with ultra short push rods um, up to the valves themselves um so only honda could have built a push rod engine with a cam chain tensioner but they did it so that made life complicated but it got even more tricky the engine was a stressed part of the frame um, we again it's something that we're quite used to nowadays but at the time it was a bit revolutionary most bike engines still use this sort of bicycle style diamond frame with uh, the engine shoved in the middle and bolted on at the corners um, but this didn't do that it the engine had to bear some load so that took away the downpipes that were needed on most motorcycles at the front and it meant that the engine could be kept 
relatively far forward, and that kept the wheelbase fairly short in turn. So it made for a fairly nimble machine. Um, what else? Well, have a look. Can you see a chain? No, you can't. It was shaft drive. Now, again, shaft drives aren't brand new. Um, shafts have been around for a long time. Um, the FN Belgian motorcycle from uh, pre-First World War, I think it was about 1912, used a shaft drive. So shafts certainly weren't new. But what they managed to do was they made it almost reactionless. Um, if you ride a to a, um, a Moto Guzzi of a similar area and uh, era, and you blip the throttle as the uh, engine spins, the crankshaft rotates and it makes the bike blip sideways. Um, Honda cancelled that out. Um, the other problem with the shaft is that the shaft actually tends to roll rise and fall as you open the throttle. Um, Honda worked on that as well, and although it still did that rise and fall on the throttle, it was less pronounced than a guzzy. Um, it was most, it was basically maintenance free as well. You just had to top the oil up occasionally and change the oil in the uh, the, the rear drive, and that was that was it. Um, what else? The innovations didn't stop. At the time, 1979, virtually every motorcycle on the road had wire wheels. Um, I'd replaced my wire wheels on my 404 with some cast wheels, um, but it was very much an aftermarket product. So to find a motorcycle coming out of a showroom with a wheel that didn't have spokes, again, was really, really innovative. And what they used here were what were called Comstar wheels. You can see that they're... Um, I'll well, just zoom in again on the picture. You can see they're five spoke, um, but they weren't conventional cast wheels. They were um, bolted up. The spokes were separate from the rim, and they actually bolted together. Um, now, traditionalists uh, looked at those and thought, "Oh, that's going to be a horrible, horrible mess. Um, they're going to get, they're going to rust, rust or rot, or they're going to fall apart." And they didn't. There's still plenty of bikes riding around on those Comstars, which are forty years old. Um, the other thing that, that they allowed was the use of tubeless tires because there were no holes in the rim. The spokes bolt to a, uh, a ridge that runs around on the inside of the rim. There were no holes in the rim. You could put tubeless tires on. And this was another horror for riders at the time. The press wrote pages asking how are they going to fix a puncture without a bead breaker to remove the tubeless tire. I distinctly one, remember one journalist writing about how it was much better to have a tubed tire because when you got a puncture, you could always stuff the tire with grass in an emergency. Um, well, yeah, if you could find a supply of cow fodder to hand. Um, but what happened was that we discovered that tubeless tires didn't get punctures with anything like the regularity of tube tires, and they certainly didn't blow out. Uh, even if you got a big nail in them, they tended to stay up at least long enough for you to get the bike to the side of the road um, under control, rather than the sort of completely out of control slalom as happened to me once when a rear tire blew out at 70 plus. Um, so it, yeah, it felt the end of um, punctures uh, for many riders. Um, but it also ended. Uh, it, it finished the horror of actually trying to get home with a completely flat tire. You couldn't fix it out on the road so easily until we got puncture repair kits, but they just didn't have the problems that tubes did. Um, what else? Well, when I took my long tour around France on my 404, um, one of the things that I had to do regularly was adjust the points. Um, no big deal if you got the, uh, the habit of doing it. If you knew how to do it, it was relatively simple. It was a case of taking engine casing off, um, looking at the little things underneath, undoing some screws. Um, you know, with a bit of practice, I could do that by eye. I didn't need timing lights or anything like that. I could just set the thing up by the eye, and it would be good enough. Um, but it needed doing. I had to do those points on the 400 every 1,000 miles. So on a 3,000-mile round trip, uh, through France, I had to stop and set those points three times. And if I didn't set the points, the, the bike got more and more rough running and eventually it wouldn't start. Um, the CX came with the electronic CDI ignition. Um, just It was there. It just worked. You turn the ignition on, you press the starter button, and the bike fired up. You never had to look about it, uh, look at it. The, again, it, it came under fire from journalists who said that they'd be unreliable, um, guess what you've got on your 
right now you've got electronic CDI and the CX was one of the bikes that pioneered that uh, electronic reliability. Um, you'll notice too that there isn't a kickstart. Um, that was another innovation at this time. Some bikes were still coming with a, believe it or not, with a kickstart under the seat. They'd taken the, uh, the actual lever off the bike, um, but the boss was still there that you could connect it to. And if you couldn't get it started, then the old um, manual boot was there if you needed it. Um, no such luck with the CX500. It didn't need it. Um, the electrics barely gave any trouble. Um, there was a big 14 amp hour battery, much bigger than on many of today's bikes, and it was a reliable first press starter. That's something we take for granted now. We don't even think about a bike not starting. We just press the button and it goes. But it was really quite unique back then in the days when, you know, we still had to do a lot of servicing on motorcycles. You could also see where you were going. In 1979, a halogen headlight was still something of a novelty. I'd fitted a halogen headlight replacement to my um, my 404, which was just a year earlier in model. Um, but the CX actually came with one as standard, and it was spectacularly effective. Um, it lit the way uh, brilliantly. If there was a criticism, it was that the beam was a bit too focused. And when I took it up into the mountains, my own machine, um, I found it was difficult to see round corners because the beam was so precisely focused. But for seeing where you're going in a straight line, it was absolutely amazing uh, com by comparison with what was available at the time. And something that uh, no bike has at the moment, um, it had three tail lights. There were two brake lights and there was a third position light um, which meant it had amazing visibility from the rear um, you look at most motorcycles these days my own uh, two outside um, they have a single tail light in each um, if that bulb blows i've got no tail light with the cx you not only had one backup you had a second backup as well um, so what else did they do? Main fuse box um, was under the seat, but all the other fuses were in a neat little box on the handlebars, easy to get to. The choke was up on the handlebars. Again, you know, something we don't even think about now because we don't need chokes. Um, but do you know where your fuses are? We knew where they were on the CX500. Um, the, as I said, the five-speed gearbox rotated the opposite direction to the crank. That minimised the gauzy effect on blipping the throttle. The clutch was light. It was usable. Twin discs up front with uh, pads that worked, unlike my 404, um, and a drum at the rear. And all it, all that was needed to bring that uh, bike to a, a standstill. It was a little bit bulky, uh, 440 pounds uh, dry so you can convert that to kilos and it works out at about 200 kilos but quite frankly if you look at a lot of modern motorcycles um, in the same kind of class they've all gained weight and they're much the same weight as that CX was my XJ must be very much similar weight to the uh, the CX and it had a reasonable performance it hit about 115 miles an hour now um, like a lot of new Hondas, uh, the first batch did hit, uh, throw up some horror stories. Um, there was one very high profile test bike which ground to a halt with a crankshaft failure. Uh, the problem was that it eventually traced to continual high speed running and all the oil were getting pumped up to the heads and not being able to return quickly enough to the bottom end. So they just basically put new oilways in the top of the end of the bike and that solved that problem. Uh, the traditional Honda cam chain weakness um, was fixed with the B model, the version I had, and that also gained a neat little fly screen actually in an alloy radiator surround, and that really tidied up the front end cosmetics. Um, as the years went by, a few bikes suffered rocker shaft problems uh, with the push rods bearing on angled uh, cams at the top end. The, um, the, the There was asymmetric wear. Um, high mileage bikes needed new water pumps and alternators, which uh, were an engine out job. But basically, teething problems apart, that bike was an ultra reliable all rounder. It was comfortable, as I say, it was reasonably quick at 115 miles an hour, still not bad speed for a 500. And it was economical. Mine delivered 55 mpg pretty much wherever I rode it. It had a genuine passenger seat, something you don't get with most two seater bikes these days. And it could haul those along at 80, 90 miles an hour. It doesn't sound like much now when the benchmark for a tour is, you know, sort of BMW, uh, 12 out of 50 or something. But back then, 
a fast touring bike was a BMW R100 RS, and that only topped out at 120. So the CX was really, realistically, not a great deal slower uh, for half the engine size. So within the limitations of the suspension and narrow tyres and the eight, uh, the 19 inch front wheel, um, it handled well, uh, particularly when loaded up with a passenger. It handled well enough for my brother to ride mine in front of me and scrape the centre stand all the way around the corner, sending a shower of sparks off behind uh, behind it. Had my heart in my mouth as I thought he was about to trash my new bike, but uh, no, it was just him being exuberant. Um, it was quite high, long travel, soft, plush suspension, which handled the potholes that we've got on today's roads it would be a beautiful bike on today's roads and uh, did mean that the seat was fairly high i couldn't get both feet flat on the floor and i'm five nine uh the steering was a little bit vague at low speeds uh the front brake also tended to lock and push the original fairly grim bridgestone tires but um aftermarket pirelli phantoms uh, gave loads more grip and uh, actually, uh, that was what my brother got his uh, foot pegs and the uh, stand down on. Um, the only time you actually needed to be careful of the bike really was letting the clutch out on a down change because with the shaft driver, they did tend to lock the rear wheel if you were a bit clumsy. But quite frankly, um, anybody could learn to do that. Um, a child could do a full service on it. It used to take me 45 minutes to do the intermediate service that was cam chain tension of valves oil change and filter change and it just took another 15 minutes to check the car balance and the shaft drive lubrication that was virtually a full service so basically um all that should tell you i did own one um it was a red metallic red cx500b lovely bike um, despite being unfixable, um, it never broke down in the first place. And it was the first bike I really owned where I felt happy riding it without a bloody great tool kit, complete with tyre levers and spare tubes. So what did Honda do with this runaway sales success? Well, they did a Honda on it. Uh, they changed it. Um, they gave it a Euro-style cosmetic revamp. And though the I think the CX500 uh, um, EC model was actually much, much prettier. It came with a hefty, hefty price rise. Um, and the result was that it simply didn't sell in the same numbers. Uh, a year later, they took it out to 673 cc's, and that became the CX650E. That had a claimed uh, 70 horsepower output and allegedly could hit 125. Um, now, think about the SV650, which uh, has been running for years from Suzuki. And you'll find that the performance figures are almost identical. And that bike was 20 years after the CX650. The trouble was that the CX650 fell into a higher insurance category and it didn't sell at all. There were very, very few sales. So that basically it was soon discontinued. And what did Honda do? They replaced it with the overpriced, over-engineered and, um, and over-styled VT500E. Um, they turned the motor lengthways, um, they gave it a twin plug head, three valves. Um, it was horribly awkward to work on. It had enclosed discs, which were really nasty. Um, and rather bizarrely, that motor lived on for years in the Deauville and the Transalp, um, neither of which are, were particularly startling performers. And I sometimes speculate on what might have happened had Honda actually carried on developing that CX motor. Um, you know, how about a sports tourer with that 650 engine, modern brakes, modern tyres, 17 inch wheels, um, upside down forks, sporty twin headlight? Um, what about an alloy frame with a single sided swinger like the uh, old NC30 VFR 400 bikes? Um, maybe a bump to 85 horsepower. Um, that could give you a really, really rather interesting machine. So, sum up, CX might not be the most charismatic of bikes, um, probably doesn't stir the soul like a Black Shadow or um, a 916, uh, it might not blow your mind like a cross crank R1, but yeah, it was hated by the press, everybody laughed at its ugly looks, but it did what it wanted to do, it was very, very well designed for what the rider wanted. Um, the only thing that baffles me is that this allegedly somewhere in the order of 100,000 kilometre model is going for 1,600. Um, you know, they're still not collectible, really. 
Right, okay, I've overrun my time already, so um, I'll carry the <clears throat> next item over to the next show. Uh, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the retrospective there of the CX500. I have to go a bit misty-eyed on that bike because, um, you know, for whatever reason, um, I did love it. I got a lot of fun and pleasure out of riding that machine. Um, did a lot of long-distance journeys. Um, yeah, oddly enough, though, I never ever used it as my dispatch bike i always had something lighter and more maneuverable anyway thank you very much indeed for watching uh, survival skills here at kevin williams and 11 Zs. don't forget we'll be back on wednesday at 11 um, with the new show um so tune in then uh, until that point uh, thank you again for watching um i'll see you soon <laughs>